Welcome to our final keynote and Zoom session for what has been a really intriguing series of keynotes for this very digital version of Camera Stilo for transnational screens. I hope you've all had an enjoyable few days of stimulating conversation. And I would like to say that I've really enjoyed the panels that I've attended and I've learned so much from you all. I'm very, very grateful to those of you who have been able to present. So for the current plenary, I'd like to introduce Professor Soon Turnbull, who is Senior Professor of Communication and Media at the University of Wollongong and Acting Head of the School of Arts, English and Media. Her publications include Media Audiences, published in 2020 by Palgrave Macmillan, the TV crime drama, a 2014 publication with Edinburgh University Press, and European television crime drama and beyond, co-edited with Kim Toft Hansen and Stephen Peacock with Palgrave Macmillan in 2018. Sue is a past president of the Australian and New Zealand Communication Association and former editor of the journal Media International Australia. Sue is a recipient of no less than eight Australian Research Council grants, the most recent being concerned with the value of web series to the global screen industry, an underexamined and prescient subject. Sue is currently co-authoring a book entitled Border Crossings from Nordic Noir to Outback Noir to be published in 2022 by Edinburgh University Press. Among all this busyness, Sue has still managed to organize a keynote for us and it is titled Tracking the Transnational Detective with Sherlock, Philip and Sarah, not forgetting Jay Swan. Thank you, <laughs> Sue. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bly. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me and making me feel so welcome. Even though I would say that I'm probably not a film scholar, I'm much more a television scholar and latterly more of a scholar of crime fiction than, um, than I thought. Um, and when you invited me, you, you, Bly, that your invitation was so lovely and you said, you know, we want you to talk about screens and literature. So, and, and I know your group is about film, screens, literature. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And so I've sort of done that. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of a meandering tour. Anyway, um, I think we should get started. And um, let's begin with the end of this conference. And um, as we're speaking, the third season of the Australian TV series, Mystery, Mo Mystery Road is about to go into production. COVID willing, of course. They're shooting this one in Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. Mystery Road, the TV series, began, in fact, as two films. The first, in 2013, written and directed by Indigenous um, director Ivan Sen. And there was an impressive sequel called Goldstone. And if you're looking at that um, image of Goldstone, just notice under Magnificent, where it says, a masterpiece of outback noir. This was followed by a TV series in 2018, starring Aaron Pedersen and Judy Davis, commissioned by an indigenous woman, Sally Riley, head of scripted content at the public service broadcaster, the ABC. Sally Riley, of course, has been behind so many series, um, including Redfern Now, um, all the way through. Her track record in terms of indigenous productions is second to none. It's just extraordinary. And by the way, she is a graduate of the University of Wollongong. Just thought I might mention that. Anyway, ABC were commissioned Mystery Road, the TV series, to be produced by Bunya Productions with both national and international investment. Season two was released in 2020. One of the things that was intriguing about the film Goldstone and Mystery Road, the series, was the way in which it was indeed labelled Outback Noir. A generic label, or rather brand, as I shall argue, which overlooked the more obvious Western elements of both the films and the TV series, but which clearly signalled the series' desire to jump on the international bandwagon of Nordic Noir as a brand. Outback Noir has since become something of a thing, with crime writers such as Jane Harper, Chris Hammer, and Gary Disher all being labelled as such. And I think I'm actually blurbed on the cover of Sydney Morning Herald there on the dry, because um, I review crime fiction for the Sydney Morning and Herald and the, and the Age. 
and um, every now and again it's really nice to see something that you've said though they I'm not that important so they just go Sydney Morning Herald I'm, I, I know my place okay Gary Disher has in fact um, questioned this label Outback Noir because he's written a PhD on the subject which I got to actually mark and here he insists that the better term is rural noir however that's not what the publicists want to call it. Back on Mystery Road, at least part of the reason it was labeled Outback Noir inevitably had to do with the way in which it was pitched by the production company and the director. As indigenous director, Rachel Perkins, she directed the first season, Wayne Blair and Warwick Thornton the second. But in relation to the first season, Rachel said this, the outback is not only a description of a place beyond the city, but it is also a way of life. It is where rules are broken, where people go to hide. There is a wildness to the outback that we embraced. So um, one of the things that she says in the middle there is um, the second sentence. There is a wildness to the outback that we embraced in the making of Mystery Road, but we also embraced the tropes of the noir of the genre, the male cop, the loner. There is no femme fatale that he falls for, but an older woman, his equal, who challenges him in a battle of wills that is the dynamic center of our story. We hope that fans of the noir genre will find appeal in our show as it draws on well-established traditions. But we also hope they enjoy the journey as we dig deeper to bring layers of history, race, and feminism to the fore. The pitch for Nordic for Mystery Road is even more clear in the second quote attributed to Perkins, which attempts to position this show in relation to a number of extremely successful, successful television crime dramas. The more successful television in the mystery genre provides intrigue, but also a strong sense of place, be it Fargo, True Detective, or The Bridge. All these series provide an immersive experience into a distinctive world. We went to great lengths to shoot our series on some of the remotest and most spectacular landscapes in Australia. This landscape also has a deep history a black and white conflict, which we mine to give greater layers. It is a universal story of colonization, which is the undercurrent of what on its surface seems to be a cop show but also has something to say about our country, our history, and a future where two cultures must exist together and reconcile their past. Notice the reference here to the Danish-Swedish production, The Bridge. And I'm wondering, did Perkins know at the time of the release of Mystery Road season one about the casting choices that were being made for season two, which presented us with Sophia Helen, who we all first met as Saga Noren in the bridge as a Swedish archeologist, desperate to rescue an ancient indigenous site before it is destroyed by King Tide. While the success of season two is debatable, Helen's arrival on the scene clearly sparked an interest in the series as these statistics from Parrot Analytics suggest. Now, Parrot Analytic is, is one of these companies and um, we're buying data from them for our project um, that looks at the social media interest that circulates around a particular TV series. So if you look at this and you look at the first spike, that is season one of Mystery Road. And then you get the second spike, which is season two of Mystery Road, when it starts with Halen and all the publicity that surrounded it. So this is just for the SBS audience, but you can see that that really was significant. Well, I'm going to come back to Mystery Road and the casting of Helen. I want to do so, do so by what seemed like a good idea at the time, but which might be something of a meandering route that derives from the project that I'm currently winding up entitled Border Crossings, the transnational career of the television crime drama. This project ironically began with a successful ARC application that opened with the Swedish Danish TV production, The Bridge, and the image of the body carefully laid out on the Orosund Bridge that connects Denmark with Sweden. 
as you might remember if you've seen it, the body in question was actually two bodies. The top half being that of a well-known Swedish politician and the bottom half that of a Danish prostitute who no one seemed to care had gone missing. This composite body, carefully set across a national border, was intended to draw attention to the disparity in the ways in which the police address the death of a female victim from different walks of life in both jurisdictions. It also served to focus attention, attention on the tensions between Sweden and Denmark, as the two tech detectives, Sago Noren from Malmo and Martin Roder from Copenhagen, were forced to work together on the case. As Janet McCabe argues, following Chalabi 2016, what the bridge effectively gave us was a geopolitical, bilateral, bilingual thriller that speaks to new global trading patterns in scripted formats. And as evidence of this, McCabe notes that the series has now been um, adapted in five different geopolitical contexts. One on the American um, Mexican border, in the US version, England and France, the tunnel, Estonia and Russia in most, Malaysia and Singapore, um, with the obviously the, um, the title The Bridge in translation, Germany and Austria, the Pass. As she goes on to argue in her excellent essay, and that's still from the Malaysian Singaporean version, uh, the cover there. Janet argues that what the transnational success of the bridge offers us is an insight into the ways, into new ways of transnational collaborative thinking based on an entwined dynamic involving the local with the national, the regional and the global. And we'll come back to that proposition at the end of this um, presentation. What the global success of the Scandi Noir series, such as The Bridge and before it, The Killing, and after it, Trapped, set in Iceland, and here they are in their original languages. What they told us was that we're in a new era when it comes to the production of television crime drama. One in which producers are looking not only to their national markets, but increasingly towards the international market they can be reached through the streaming services that offer video on demand, services such as Netflix, Acorn TV, and indeed our own SBS on demand. These streaming services are well equipped to deliver these shows to what our Foxtel informant described as the global niche audience for, for Nordic Noir, who are more than willing to embrace the sometimes necessary subtitles. While this transnational circulation has been enabled through bilateral and sometimes multilateral co-productions and streaming services, my argument here is that a large part of the success of this trade in transnational TV crime depends on its origins in a type of genre literature broadly identified as crime fiction that was itself transnational from the start and which has underpinned the success of a whole series of on-screen detectives over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. And here we begin my first segue into the uh, literary world of the detective. So I'm gonna start and illustrate this argument using three case studies of literary detectives who've made it onto the screen. Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marler, and Wallander. Although Sarah Lund and Saga Noren are just as important in this story. So let's start with Sherlock. As Alan Barnes argues is in, in his invaluable reference book, Sherlock Holmes on Screen, since his first appearance in the short story, A Study in Scarlet, published in 1887 in Beaton's Christmas Annual, Holmes has appeared more times on screen than any other literary character, with the exception of Dracula, who's not counted because he's not human. As Barnes points out, one can observe almost I'll get that up. One can observe almost every historical, cultural, and technological development in the moving image purely through the changing representation of Holmes on screen. <laughs> and just for starters, that screen career arguably begins with a one minute mutoscope film produced by the Biograph Company in New York City entitled Sherlock Holmes Baffled. And you can find it on YouTube very easily. 
It's designed to be watched alone on a peep show machine with a handle that you crank to view the images. Sherlock Holmes Baffled uses a stop frame technique to make the robber appear and disappear in ways that echo the work of the French um, of George Méliès, so beautifully realized in Martin Scorsese's wonderful film, Hugo. And here, by the way, is a mutoscope. You put your money in and you turned your handle and you could watch Sherlock Holmes Baffled. But this was only the beginning of Hong's film journey. By 1908, he had traveled to Denmark to appear in the first of a series of silent films written and directed and starring Viggo Larsson entitled Sherlock Holmes, He Lives Far, which I think means Sherlock Holmes Lives Here. A series that also included the intriguing sound of Arsene Lupin contra Sherlock Holmes in 1910. And given the success of the recent French reimagining of Lupin on Netflix, if I hope you've caught it. I would love to see that one play out. Sherlock Holmes' first television appearance, and I'll note that I'm always very wary about firsts, but I'm putting firsts in scare quotes. But it was in 1937, right, almost 20 years before Australia got TV, in a teleplay of the story The Three Garridobes, produced by NBC Radio City in New York. Three years before Basil Rathbone, or as my mother used to call him, Razzle Bathbone, um, brought Sherlock Holmes to the life in The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1940. According to Barnes, this first American television production, which I don't have a still from, involved three very small sets and two pre-filmed inserts, one of the London skyline, they cheated, and the other filmed in Central Park, as Watson and Holmes take a handsome cab. But let's pause here and reflect on Holmes' transnational career. For a start, he did not appear out of nowhere. Crime writing was already bubbling away in the 19th century before Conan Doyle invented the, his aesthetic ratiocinative detective. Think Edgar Allan Poe in the US, who set his short story, Murders in the U Morgue, featuring the ratiocinative detective C. Auguste Dupin, in, um, published in 1841, in Paris, where the tales of the French criminal turned detective, Vidoc, were an inspirational for Poe and many other writers, British and American. And let's not forget all those women crime writers that Lucy Sussex has demonstrated were involved in the genre from the start as well, but whose contribution has largely been overlooked in the literary canon. While it's quite easy to imagine Holmes traveling to the US and to other English speaking nations as an effect of the transnational travel of a middle class who might also be involved in film and television production. What's also intriguing is the fact that Holmes was traveling so well in translation. He was hugely popular in Russia, where one of the most successful TV adaptations of his work featured Vasily Livanov channeling Sidney Paget's illustrations, the first vision of Holmes. So what was the singular attraction of Sherlock Holmes? To which I can only reply, there's a huge amount of speculation about this and about why people read crime fiction more generally. And I could go off on a complete tangent here because I've actually done some research myself on this field with Sisters in Crime Australia. However, what I will offer is a little autoethnographic um, moment and note that my first encounter with Sherlock was on the printed page in the 1950s in the north of England while recovering from scarlet fever when I was about eight or nine. Ordered not to read in bed, I did so by torchlight, reading every single one of the short stories and the novellas, resulting in the onset of my considerable short-sightedness once I emerged from the bedroom. And my favorite story, The Speckled Band, which I found um, in this version, which is in fact a graphic novel version intended for eight to 10 year olds. So somewhere along the line, somebody's realized that you know Sherlock Holmes works quite well with young people as well, though I read him in the original original. Long before the millennial phenomenon of crime scene investigations, Holmes was using scientific methods of observation to solve crime. 
These stories were not about crime as a social problem. They were about crime as a semiotic and scientific puzzle to be solved. And this, of course, relates to Peter's um, first um, keynote about the utopian vision of science in the 19th century. And I kind of love this fact because Holmes is obviously the epitome of that. However, this notion of crime as a scientific puzzle, puzzle to be solved is hardly the case when we come to um, Raymond Chandler. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention um, the semiotics and Umberto Eco. I still have my copy of The Role in the Reader. Um, Umberto Eco, of course, loved Sherlock Holmes and his um, romance of the, um, his wonderful book, the, the Rose, names just escaped me for a second there, um, was also a kind of Holmesian mystery story. Anyway, I wanted to come to Philip Marlowe next. Raymond Chandler, Philip Marlowe, his private investigator, who first appeared in a short story entitled The Finger Man, but most famously in The Big Sleep, published in 1939. And I know I'm taking a big leap here myself from Sherlock Holmes to Chandler, from the classic British detective story to the classic American hard-boiled crime novel. But I want to present them as two sides of the same coin when it comes to the history of crime writing. As Peter, as Robert Portfirio puts it, the pre-existential world of the classic detective was ordered and meaningful. Social aberrations were temporary and quickly righted through the detective's superior powers of deductive reasoning. The hard-boiled writers replaced this with a corrupt, chaotic world where the detective's greatest asset was the sheer ability to survive with a shred of dignity. Usually identified with the school of hard-boiled writers, Raymond Chandler was born in 1888 in Chicago, one year after Sherlock Holmes. After the early death of his father, he moved to England with his mother in 1900, where he was educated at Dulwich College. And in 1907, he became a British subject. After a year in the civil service and an unsuccessful stint as a would-be journalist, and you might note in this story as I go on how many journalists there actually are as crime writers. He returned to the US in 1912, the year the Titanic sank, which uh, coincidentally was, was the night my father was born. Not on the Titanic, but he was born the night the Titanic went down. And clearly Chandler wasn't on the Titanic either. He made it back to the United States. And he joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force and fought in the trenches during World War I. After the war, Chandler returned to America to reinvent himself as a writer, inspired by the success of the pop magazine Black, Black Mask and his role model, Earl Stanley Gardner, the creator of Perry Mason. Chandler's first Marlowe novel, The Big Sleep, published in 1939, found its way onto the screen in 1946, after many battles with the censors, in a highly stylized film starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall with a screenplay by, and this is the screenplay, you probably know this, William Faulkner, Lee Brackett, who was herself, had written a crime novel and who went on to write science fiction, went on to write many more screenplays for Westerns and also for The Empire Strikes Back. She went on writing, she was a key figure in Hollywood. And the third writer was Jules Firstman. However, even before The Big Sleep, Chandler himself had been working on a screenplay with director, um, Austrian direct, film director, filmmaker, Billy Wilder. Wilder's own first screenplay back in Germany was for a silent thriller entitled The Daredevil Reporter in 1929, drawing on his background as a journalist. Wilder and Chandler's adaptation of James M. Cain's novel, Double Indemnity, was released in 1944, with Wilder subsequently acknowledging that the taught dialogue was largely Chandler's. And so it came to pass that Double Indemnity was one of a series of films shown in Paris after the Second World War that included, and here they are, John Huston's The Maltese Falcon, Otto Preminger's Lorda, and Fritz Lang's The Woman in the Window, that inspired French cineast Nino Frank 
and Jean-Pierre Chartier to use the adjective noir when attempting to evaluate them in 1946. This is, of course, not so much a moment of origin as the recognition of a set of themes, preoccupations and styles that we now know as film noir. And in their introduction to the now classic film noir and encyclopedic reference guide, editors Alan Silver and Elizabeth Ward point to the incongruity of the fact that here we have a French term being to, used to describe a group of films that are a self-contained reflection of American cultural preoccupations in film form. The use of the adjective noir, they suggested, was largely because the films in question were based on American books by authors such as Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, James M. Kane, and Horace McCoy that were published under the generic title of Série Noire by the publisher Gallimard. With their distinctive black covers, it's thought that these books may well have inspired Frank and Chartier to first use the term noir, although, to be honest, the sheer darkness of the films in terms of their mood and lighting can't be ruled out. There is, of course, now a vast literature on film noir, neo-noir, and we'll get to Nordic noir eventually, with much of the debate concerning whether or not film noir is actually a genre or a philosophy or a worldview. I'm not going to engage with that debate here, but point instead to Paul Schrader's still useful notes on film noir, in which he identifies a number of features that pertain to the films in question. First, he points to their moment of production during the Second World War and post-war disillusionment. Secondly, he notes how these films mark a return to realism as a style. Thirdly, he notes the significant contribution of the German emigres to Hollywood, including Wilder, Lang, and Ophuls, who made such a distinctive use of expressionist chiaroscuro lighting and contrast. Lastly, he points to the fact that so many of these films in their initial phase drew on the hard-boiled tradition of American crime writing, concluding, and the most hard-boiled Hollywood writers was Raymond Chandler, whose script of double indemnity from, James M. Kane, from a James M. Kane story was the best written and most characteristically noir of the period. While I'm not sure I quite agree with Schrader's assessment of Chandler being the most hard-boiled, there is no doubt that Chandler, and indeed the hard-boiled tradition of American crime writing, was to have a significant effect on the portrayal of the detective on screen and on the written page over the subsequent years. The figure of the world-weary, hard-drinking detective, private or unhappily attached to the police force, the lonely, disenchanted man of few words, coping with the effects of social problems that are ultimately impossible to solve, wends his solitary way through the history of crime fiction writing in the 20th century. Sometimes with a twist, sometimes subverted, as he was in the feminist private eye novel of the, of the 70s and 80s. Sometimes he's a police detective. Think Morse, think Rebus, think Wallander. Sometimes he's a woman. Think Jane Tennyson, Sarah Lund, Saga Noren. Although it might be noted that these female characters did not begin on the printed page. So alongside the trajectory of the literary detective on screen, we also have the stylistics of film noir percolating through screen culture and on television to arrive at a moment when following the surprise success of the Danish series, The Killing, on BBC4 in 2011, a note that it was in fact shown on Danish television in 2007 and in Australia, on SBS On Demand in 2010, we discovered it first, Nordic Noir becomes the new noir on the block. And as in the case of film noir, everyone has since been scrambling for definitions and origins that interestingly also always link back to a literary detective. In the case of Nordic Noir, this search for a point of origin inevitably tracks back through a rather different literary lineage. This often includes Stieg Larsson and his Millennium series that began with the girl with the dragon tattoo 
or Men Who Hate Women in its original title. Henning Mankell's Wallander in his many screen incarnations, and that is for Faceless Killers in the original Swedish. And let's not forget, of course, Kenneth Branagh as the pink-eyed Wallander in a field of mustard grass with a blue sky mirroring the colours of the Swedish flag. But this lineage usually tracks back to arrive at Maisjoval and Per Valol, two Marxist journalists who published 10 novels between 1965 and 1975, collectively referred to as the story of a crime, featuring the tortured detective Martin Beck. And there they are, the pair of them. Disenchanted and deeply critical of the Swedish social democratic model, according to Valoma himself, they wanted to use the crime fiction genre, and this is a real Marxist speaking here, as a scalpel to slit up the belly of the ideologically pauperized and morally debatable so-called welfare state of the bourgeois type. They were clearly influenced by the hard-boiled school of American writing, and also by their own admission, the work of another American writer of police procedurals, Ed McBain. As it is, Valo and Siwal have come to function as the mythic literary origin of Nordic noir, which like film noir may not really be a genre at all, but actually a form of branding. Using the label noir now appears to be the preferred way to sell the latest iteration of a TV series or a crime novel to an audience who is looking for more of the same. Netflix has used that kind of Nordic noir labeling in order to provide you with that um, suite of shows to follow on with. Noir lets the audience know that this is a series that knows what has gone before in terms of the history of the form. The ratiocinative detective and the push to solve the crime by science that is Holmes, the hard-boiled detective with a failed marriage that is Marlowe and Wallander, And there we go. And, and in offering this possibility that they are going to offer something that is exactly the same as what has gone before, but also completely different, which is the first rule of television, I have been told. At which point, I want to explore Mystery Road, come back to where we started from, and the terms laid out by Janet McCabe in relation to the bridge as an example of a transnational collaborative thinking based on an entwined dynamic involving the local with the national, the regional and the global. And that's because I'm, in, um, I'm very much um, in the, the um, field of production studies. Let's start with Mysteries Road's production pedigree. This would include the local and the regional in terms of support from Screen West and the Western Australian Regional Film Fund. The national, in terms of the ABC and Bunya Productions. But also the international, in terms of the American streaming platform, Acorn, which secured the North American rights as well as secondary rights in the UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. Also on board for international distribution was all three media, who have distributed many Australian series, including Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, which is now international success, and in fact has been remade as Miss S in a Chinese version showing on Netflix in Asia and is apparently hugely successful there. When we come to how this transnational success, um, how when we've come to Mystery Road and its transnational ambition and success, we inevitably have to come to what we see on the screen. As Fairfax TV reviewer Debbie Enker noted, the first striking thing about Mystery Road is the landscape, a vast night sky sparkling with stars, expanses of baked earth, bulbous boab trees, imposing mountain ranges and outcrops of red rock. Ancient, monumental, remote, spectacular. Although this color palette may be very different from Nordic Noir, and I'm thinking here of Fortitude, set vaguely in the Arctic Circle, trapped 
Ofef, set in Iceland. And most recently, and this is the one that I was going to offer you if you haven't seen it, um, this is the one to watch tonight. Thin Ice, set in Greenland. I want to argue that Mystery Road uses landscape not just as a backdrop, but as a thematic element in order to make a number of similar geopolitical points. In Mystery Road, as in these Nordic series, local and regional issues are also global issues. These might include, and they do across these series, disputed land ownership, dispossession, the effects of human-induced climate change, and the exploitation of scarce resources. So, while Jay Swan may dress like a cowboy, he is a taciturn, hard-boiled loner at heart, doomed to disappointment, even if and when he might solve the case. Like Philip Marlowe and Mankels Wallander, Sara Lund or Saga Noren, while he might eventually get to the bottom of the case in hand, he can never solve the larger problems of the society in which he lives that inevitably, in his case, have also to deal with indigenous dispossession. Now, far from this indigenous focus being a local, regional and limiting factor in the potential transnational career of the TV crime drama, as Penny Smallcomb, head of Green Australia's indigenous production unit, suggested in relation to the first series. Television audiences around the world are embracing indigenous stories and with Rachel Perkins at the helm, a stellar cast on board and stunning locations, the series is set to be a success both in Australia and internationally. And once again, we can turn to the examples drawn from the Nordic noir tradition to support this argument, including the French-Swedish series Midnight Sun, that focused on the plight of the Sami people. And more recently, the Swedish-Danish co-production Thin Ice, set in Greenland, that addresses in no small measure the plight of the Greenlandic people facing global warming in the Arctic. And I don't know if you can see who is involved in the funding. I pulled this off IMDB um, Pro today. We have um, TV Seymour at the top, TV4, Yellowbird, which is the production company behind Wallander, Saga Film, which is a production pump company based in Iceland, France Television, Media Programs of the European Union, the Nordisk Film and TV Fund, the Icelandic Film Centre, and Sweden. So you have this, this massive kind of production um, uh, fund coming in behind this series, which deals with, which is amazing. It deals with um, Sweden spearheading a treaty to stop oil drilling in the Arctic um, with the support of Denmark and Iceland and Russia, but before anybody, and America, but before anybody can get to the table, somebody spikes the treaty and it looks as though it's all going to fall on its head. And it's, it's who's caused this? It's, it's the Russians trying to sell it, shoot it down. It's Denmark trying to shoot it down. It's America trying to shoot it down. Meanwhile, the, um, the wonderful Greenlandic, Greenlandic um, man on the sled is having to kill his dogs because he can't afford to feed them anymore. And it's a, it's a, a vivid realization of, of what is happening on the Arctic Circle. So we come back to Sarah, um, to Saga Lauren, and um, to the casting, casting of Sophia Helen in Mystery Road as a scientist who is confronted not by the past, but by the insoluble problems of the present. While this might be the most blatant evidence to date of the show's global ambition, its desire to sit alongside the best of the best when it comes to crime on television, to attract the audience for Nordic noir and relocate them to the outback. I hope I've also managed to demonstrate that the success of this show is also dependent on a tradition of crime on screen that has its rhizomatic roots in the history of the literary detective. Last, but by no means least, there is the question of whether it is good enough to do so. And quite honestly, season two was a bit of a disappointment. But there's still season three to look forward to when Judy Davis will return 
and Jay Swan will once again wander through the red outback. Thank you.